Up until now, we've described generally pretty simplistic states of stress on their own when we talk about whether a part is in yielding. And so the question becomes, how do we determine whether yielding is occurring when I don't have just a single number to compare things to? You'll recall that for the basic mechanics approach, we have taken our data from a tensile test from a coupon that looks kind of like this, a uniaxial tensile test, where we basically take a round sample, pull it apart, measure the strain and the load applied, calculate the stress, and then plot the two versus each other, and we get a stress-strain curve. So this is actual data from a test of 6061T6 aluminum. We find the yield point by convention by taking the best fit line for the elastic range, offsetting at 0.2%, and where that crosses the stress-strain curve right here at about what appears to be 43 KSI, we would report that as our yield strength, where we've had a little bit of onset of plastic deformation. Now, in this case, this is the stress statement that we had. We had this very simple uniaxial tensile test, P over A, and that was 43,000 PSI when yielding started to occur. Therefore, the yield load was 2,100 pounds. We can back calculate that knowing the diameter here. And so we had this stress state. It was uniaxial tensile stress. Here is our stress tensor. It can't get simpler than this. But the question becomes, what happens if I were to impose a shear on that how would I determine whether this complicated stress state is in yielding? Because I don't have nine numbers to compare to. When we read a yield strength out of a book, it's one number. So what do I do? There was a lot of activity surrounding solid mechanics, especially in the 19th century, as we were discovering and being, becoming capable of measuring a lot of things that we weren't capable of doing before because of the Industrial Revolution. In the midst of this, Henri Tresca came up with a theory in 1864, well it was published in 1864, about the maximal shear stress in the material. Sometimes it's referred to as the maximum shear stress theory or sometimes just Tresca. And it's actually Tresca guessed, uh, like any other theory, it was developed in connection with a lot of other people or a lot of other people were probably working on similar things at the same time. In any case, he said that the plastic deformation onset is when maximum shear stress on any element, so an element in a combined stress state, shows the same level of shear stress as the element in a uniaxial tensile test at the yield point. It's kind of a mouthful, so let me summarize. He said that if I have a combined stress state, it has a Mohr's circle. I can draw that Mohr's circle and find the maximum shear exhibited in that element. And when that maximum shear is equal to the maximum shear that was shown in the test from uniaxial tension, that will predict the onset of yielding. So let's draw a uniaxial tensile test more circle. From the previous slide, we had sigma xx and zero. There was no shear stress. We had one uniaxial tensile stress at 43,000 PSI, and so this is a very easy circle to draw. We have sigma one is equal to sigma xx, and sigma two and sigma three are both zero by inspection. Any uniaxial tensile test will have a more circle that appears the same, with sigma xx equal to whatever stress level you're talking about. We notice very quickly that, oh yeah, the maximum shear stress is gonna be then half of that, in this case at 21,500 PSI. So let's do an example. According to the Tresca criterion, would the stress cube below plastically deform if it was made from the same aluminum from the first slide? So now we've decreased our axial stress just a little bit from the yield point, but we've imposed a slight shear. Now, you might say, well, 42,500 plus 3,500 is 4, 000, sorry, uh, 46,000, so as a result, that, that must be yielding. Well, it doesn't add exactly that way. Remember, we need to combine this with Mohr's circle and find the maximum shear. So let's plot Mohr's circle for this material, or sorry, for this, uh, this state of stress. And so I've got 42,500 and 3,500, and I can draw that more circle pretty easily. I can actually identify what my sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three values are by simply taking the eigenvalues of the stress tensor. You can take your three by three stress tensor, whatever it is, take those eigenvalues, and you get more circle sigma one is slightly elevated from 42,500, sigma 2 is 2, or sorry, sigma 2 is 0, and sigma 3 is slightly negative. 
So we have 42,786 here on the right, that's sigma 1. Sigma 2 would be 0, and sigma 3, by convention, would be negative 286 psi here. So Tresca says the maximal shear stress from this Mohr's circle, or the radius here, is what matters. And we can calculate that and find that it's going to be equal to 42,786 plus 286 over 2. And that's 21,536. If you recall from the first slide, our maximal shear stress shown was 21,500 at yield. This is greater than that. Therefore, Tresco would predict that, yes, this will cause yielding. So again, Tresca says the maximum shear stress on an element is what determines yielding. And we can state this very concisely by saying tau max from my combined stress state is equal to the yield strength over 2 at the onset of yield. Recalling that the maximum shear stress is half of the diameter of Mohr's circle, I can easily also say that sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is equal to the yield strength from the uniaxial tensile test at the onset of yield. Or another way to kind of phrase that would be to say, when my combined stress state has sigma 1 minus sigma 3 equal to or greater than the yield strength, yielding is occurring. If sigma 1 minus sigma 3 from my combined stress state is less than the yield strength from the uniaxial tensile test, then yielding is not occurring. And this allows me to take those combined stresses and compare them. Again, this was the mid-19th century, not born out of an experiment until the late 19th century, at which point there was a flurry of activity in material science. We were learning a lot, and come along this guy named Richard von Mises. In 1913, and this is also one of those theories that can be referred to a number of different ways, he came up with a new theory called the distortion energy theory, or sometimes um, the von Mises Henke theory, or that you know, lots of different people were involved, lots of different ways to refer to it, but it's generally called the von Mises stress. He said that plastic deformation occurs when the distortion energy on an element reaches the same level exhibited in an element in the uniaxial tensile test at the yield point. It's a very similar expression as to what Tresca was looking at, but Vamisi said it's not just maximum shear that matters. All three principal stresses matter and can contribute at once, where uh, Tresca only considers sigma 1 and sigma 3. Vamisi approached it from a different way, and you can actually reach his result from a couple of different der derivation approaches. Uh, probably one that you'll encounter if you take a graduate level mechanics course would be to start with the second invariant of the strain, or sorry, stress tensor, and you can derive essentially the von Mises principle from that. So when we talk about von Mises, we express it with this sigma prime, with a, an apostrophe after the sigma. And we say that that's the effective stress. So we're going to take a stress tensor, we're going to calculate an effective single number stress and say the effective stress on that element is equal to this single number, and that is the distortion energy. Again, this ignores the effects of hydrostatic stress and simply looks at the deformation. So it, it is still a function of the principal stresses, sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three, and ignores the hydrostatic stress in its derivation. One of the first things you do in the derivation of this is to separate hydrostatic from deviatoric stresses. And von Mises said that yield occurs when this sigma prime is equal to or greater than the yield point from my tensile test. Again, good for ductile materials, not necessarily brittle materials. Uh, brittle materials have a different failure criterion. Norton expresses it thusly. He says that sigma prime is the uniaxial tensile stress that would act that would create the same distortion energy as is created by the actual combination of applied stresses or the combined stress state that we're talking about. And so von Mises came up with his theory and started to test it out. You might recognize his name. His brother Ludwig von Mises was a famous famous economist, uh, and and the two did actually quite a bit of academic work. So let's take a look back at the stress state that we just looked at from the perspective of Tresco. So we took the yield point and said, well, okay, I'm going to back off the tensile stress a little bit, but then I'm going to impose a shear, and let's see whether von Mises predicts that that would be in yielding. So again, I've got my stress state here with 42,500 PSI in tension, not quite enough to cause yielding, 3,500 PSI in shear, which, okay, now the combination, does that cause yielding or no? Uh, 
And so again, I've got the same principal stresses. My Mohr circle has sigma one equal to 42,786, sigma three equal to negative 286, and sigma two equal to zero. And so we would think, oh yeah, it's, you know, I've got my principal stresses, it'll probably be very similar. If we use our equation here to calculate this, it says that we have 42,930 PSI. So deterministically speaking anyway, von Mises would predict that this is not in a state of yielding. In reality, we are beyond the what we would call the proportional limit. So there's a little bit of per permanent deformation. But von Mises predicts that we are under the yield criterion at this point, while Tresca, for the same stress state, predicts that we are above it. Uh, Tresca is generally more conservative than von Mises. There are points where they are actually equivalent, but that is something to be aware of. So what happens if I impose a hydrostatic stress? By hydrostatic stress, I mean I take my cube and I throw it into a deep part of the ocean, and I put 10,000 PSI on all sides of the cube. What happens to that? Well, we can take our principal stresses and find that our principal stresses have changed dramatically. We have 32,786, negative 10,000, and negative 10,286. Holy cow, we have this huge change in our principal stresses. And so we would expect that this would drastically change our outcome. Tresca says, no, we have the same stress. Huh, that's weird. Von Mises says, no, we have the same stress that he predicted before. Why is that? Well, if you think about Moore's circle, we didn't change the diameter of the circle at all. All we did was shift it left and right. And in reality, if you throw a cube into the ocean, and then dive down and pick it back up and bring it back up, it will have experienced no plastic deformation because the stresses on it were hydrostatic and it's a solid piece of material. Therefore, both of these theories accurately predict that hydrostatic stresses cannot impose plastic deformation. This is the perspective from which, especially the von Mises criterion, is derived.